what Jenny was just talking about. I think as technologists, a lot of us are playing with all these things on the side for fun. And um, Kickstarter is just kind of the next step. So I don't know, if, has anyone done a Kickstarter before? Yeah, a couple of you? So it's just a great way to share your little side projects that you're doing for fun with the rest of the world. So um, I changed the title of my, my presentation here. I got home on, uh, on Wednesday night from our Navarra trip and my um, husband sent me a note. He knew I was gonna talk to you guys about Kickstarter and he's like, have you seen the latest South Park episode? And I was like, no. And he's like, you have to watch it, it's about Kickstarter. So um, I watched it and it was hilarious and I wanted to play you guys a quick little um, clip here. It's called crowdfunding, using the internet to raise money without having to pay back your investors. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, you have to check out this episode. It's, it's hilarious. Um, and it, it's kind of like, you know, how South Park is. They make fun of a lot of things. So they're kind of saying that some of the bad things about Kickstarter, like the potato salad uh, campaign, if you guys all saw that, how, you know, you don't have to do anything. You're making all this money. So I'm here today to talk to you about my experience with Kickstarter. So for those of you who don't know me, I'll well, cut off a little bit, but I'm Lisa C. Gattaluca. I'm a mobile software engineer at IBM. I'm part of our open technologies team, so I get to work on open source. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Angel Diaz, but he's, he's uh, the lead of our organization. Um, I've been a committer on Apache Cordova, so I do hybrid mobile development. And part of that, before I was in mobile, I was doing cloud. So I did a lot with our IBM Bluemix built on Cloud Foundry and having a, the intersection of mobile and cloud computing. So you're probably asking yourself, why, why is she talking to us about Kickstarter? <laughs> um, I'm also a master inventor at IBM and I love coming up with new ideas, like tinkering with gadgets like Jenny does. Like it's just a way of learning about the future and what, like playing with new things helps you get excited about what's possible out there. So um, like any, any good nerd, I like play with things on the side and that eventually led me to Kickstarter. And I was like, oh, I can do this. I want to do a Kickstarter. So um, follow me at Lisa C. Cat, and that's my, my uh, domain name if you want to check me out. But um, one disclaimer I have, so I don't work for Kickstarter. I've only, I've done it a couple times. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other people in the room that can tell you about their experiences with Kickstarter, but um, hopefully you'll take something away from this. So my background, um, when I was really little, my parents had a, a computer with this awesome clicky keyboard. And I, I think that's how I got excited about computers. I just love the sound that my fingers would make on that keyboard. And um, I, I used to type without the, the computer even on. So I'd be, my grandma told me, uh, if you say, like, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the country, over and over again, you're using all of your fingers. So I would sit there in the dark and just type forever. But um, eventually I, I found the word processing stuff. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna write stuff. Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna write a story. So my sister and I would write stories about you know, our, our dolls, our troll dolls, and our Barbie dolls, and then we'd act them out. And I was kind of shy, so I'd never talk in front of the camera. I'd always have my you know, puppets <laughs> doing the, the show. But over time I realized that my skill wasn't so much in writing as it was in computers. So I, I kind of gave up on the writing passion and, and went down the road of, of computer science. Um, and then I had kids. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> so uh, as soon as I had kids, I immediately thought, like, how can I share my passion for technology with my kids? Because I want them to love technology the way I love technology. And when I was young, when I was at, I went to Carnegie Mellon, and when I was there, I. I had to learn binary, and I never really thought about what binary was before. Of course, I've done, you know, powers and all that when I was younger in school, but I, I never really connected the fact that it was computer language. So I thought, I always thought it would be fun to write a book on how to count to 10 in binary. So now that I have kids, it's just the perfect excuse to make a kid's book. So now that I, I had this idea in mind, I'm gonna do a kid's book, and I'm gonna have it count to 10 in binary, I was like, of course, you need robots if you're gonna be teaching binary. So I can do this myself. I'm a technologist. I know how to use Adobe Illustrator. I know how to use Photoshop. I'm just gonna do the illustrations myself. So I went to Shutterstock and I typed in robot vector and I got all these robot vectors. I'm like, oh, these are awesome. These are so cool. And I you know, downloaded a couple, tried it in Illustrator. And it's, it's hard <laughs> to be like a designer. It's, it's a lot.
lot more work than I thought it would be. I thought, you know, moving the arms up and down for a couple pages would be enough, but no. So I found a couple robot designs that I like fell in love with, and I kind of stopped the illustrator. So I went on Google and I typed in his name, and I, was, I found him on Facebook. I sent him a direct message, and I was like, "Hey, do you want to do a kids' book? And um, it's going to have robot creatures." And I told him about my storyline and everything. He's like, "Yes, I absolutely want to do it." So this guy, he was based in Latvia, so that was kind of cool, you know, talking to someone in Latvia, and he agreed to do my kids' book. So we talked about the pricing and how much it would cost to, to have him on as an illustrator. So I sent him my idea for the characters. Um, I wanted to have a robot, and Jason and Wi-Fi were going to be my two characters. <laughs> so I, I sent him um, my ideas for what I wanted, and he sent me back this awesome illustration. And, uh, you can see the little, the little icon on his belly, the JSON symbol, um, and I want to be nerdy, so he's got some braces on, and I was, I was like, this is awesome. So I was like, okay, I have twin boys, and they're fraternal, so obviously I need another robot, and it can't look exactly like this one, so he sent me another one. Um, got glasses on, the Wi-Fi symbol, this is Wi-Fi, got his little um, light bulbs going on. But of course the robots need a teacher. So it would be a mom robot for me. So I would teach the two robot twins how to count to 10 in binary. And I always wear my hair up in a ponytail, so obviously she's got the little thing going on. And she's cute. But you couldn't complete the family without a robot dog. So I have a miniature dachshund, um, and this is the final character in my, in my book. So he like sketched it all out, and then he created the vector graphics for it. Um, and we worked together to, to work on all these illustrations. And then I was like, okay, I knew I wanted to do Kickstarter, but now I like really wanted to do Kickstarter because I knew I was so excited about what this was going to turn out like. And I just wanted to share my story with the world. I'm a I'm a learn by doer. I can't just like read things. I I have to go and do it. So I saw the button, start a project. I clicked it and just read through what it takes to do a Kickstarter. The first piece of advice I'd have for you guys, if you are considering doing a Kickstarter is going in and setting up your Amazon payment because that's the slowest part of it all. Um, it can take up to seven days, like it says, to, to set up. So just do that right away from the beginning. The next part I did was I made a video. So I really struggled here with whether or not I should do the video myself or if I should pay a professional to do it. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, um, but I, I did do it myself. I'll play the first 30 seconds for you guys. Hi, I'm Lisa, but computers call me I am passionate about computers, and I can tell my sons are too. Every year there are over 12,000 new computer science graduates in the United States alone. In the next 10 years, the Department of Labor Statistics projects the number of software engineers to grow twice as fast as the average profession. Without a doubt, my kids will be using computers in some fashion in their future careers. But um, So that was one thing I kind of struggled with was whether I should do it, it myself or if I should pay a professional. And, it happened to be Christmas break, I had some vacation at work, so I'm like, I'll just do it myself. And I, I had a lot of fun doing it with myself, so um, I'll tell you more about the video later. But. So the next part was setting the duration. So with Kickstarter, you have um, an option of doing from one to 60 days of your duration. They usually recommend 30 days. Um, I did 30 days for this first project. And the next thing you'll want to do is set your funding goal. And I have stone behind it because the funding goal and the duration are the things that are set in stone. So once you hit the go live button, you can't go back and Kickstarter and say, oh, I actually want this campaign to go a little longer. Or I want to set my funding thing higher. Maybe I'm not quite going to reach my goal, so I'm going to lower it just a little bit because I, I do want to reach my funding goal. Kickstarter is all or nothing. So if you don't reach whatever your goal is, you don't get funded. But you can try again a second time. So if you don't reach your funding goal, you can um, come, back, come back in and, and lower it or make the changes that you need to do. And then the next part is creating the page. So um, Mikey kind of talked about this yesterday, how after you create that page, you can go back in and, and edit it after you hit live. So this isn't as important. Oh, one thing my, Mikey also mentioned was um, the process was kind of slow in the getting, getting approval from Kickstarter, and that's no longer the case anymore. When I did this project, it was, but now they uh, have actually made it really easy. So you click go and it's, it's live. I think certain types of projects, you do have to go through the approval process first, like hardware projects, but everything else you don't have to. So the next part before you go live is setting your rewards. 
I played around a lot with what I was going to do for this. Since I'm a mobile engineer, I thought, you know, I need to, I need to have a mobile component to my book. So I created an animated ebook with it as well, and I offered that as an award to the, the backers of my project. And it was like $3. I figured that's how much I'd probably charge on the App Store anyway, so um, I would add that in. But, and then I was like, okay, and then I'll create two versions of my app. So I'll have the paid version on the app stores, and then I'll have a free version where you just log in with your email address and like the, the code for Kickstarter, and you'd be able to have that. No, it doesn't work like that. Apple does not like that. <laughs> so I had to come up with a sneaky way in order to let, don't, don't record this, to let um, my app get accepted within the app store. And so what I did, so if you guys want to download my app, you can just download the free version and you can try this little trick. But what I did was I made it so my backers had to enter uh, 210, which is the number of backers I had for the ebook. And then when they entered 210, there's a little, you can't really see it's cut off, but there's a Kickstarter logo. So they hit the Kickstarter logo and then bring them to a secret login page. So uh, now it has functionality because it's a binary calculator, um, but it also let them unlock the free version. <coughs> so if you do want to get my free version, um, I added a bunch of logins for, um, for today. So info at a robotstory.com and the password is robotkick if you want to check out my, my animated ebook version of this. And as a mobile developer, I was like, oh, I have to have a mobile side of this, an animated ebook. And I have so much respect now for people that do animated ebooks and games. It was a lot of work. It was so much more work doing the animated ebook than it was to just do a Kickstarter and do the book itself. So it was really fun playing with like PNG sequences and all about like, you know, CSS transformations. And I, I learned a lot. Uh, my next piece of advice would be not to do t-shirts for rewards. <laughs> I did. I was like, okay, it's like $25, I'll do a t-shirt reward, and I'll, I'll make a lot of money on it. And um, It sucked when it came to fulfillment time, because you had to, like, everyone has different t-shirt sizes, you had to match up the right person with, like, the backer with their t-shirt size, and then people would change their mind. And, oh, I really want a size small now, or do you have a triple XL? And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll... I'll get you one of those, because you want to make everyone happy. So my advice, don't do t-shirts. But then again, do t-shirts, because the profit margin is awesome. It's such a <laughs> if you have a lot of backers, then like, you know, the more t-shirts you buy, the price per t-shirt goes way down. So I was like, yeah, I'll do t-shirts. So, it's up to you how much time you want to spend. Shipping outside the US, so this was a tough one for me because I, I wanted, the whole point of this was to share my story with the world, not just the US. So I wanted to be able to let people from all over come and buy my book. But, um, so I, I was like, all right, maybe I can make it worth my time if I package three of them together. So if they buy three books for, for $40, they can have this shipped all over the world. And um, I don't know how other projects do it, but some countries that back my project, it was like over $40 to send them my books. So um, just think, keep that in mind when you're going to be shipping outside the US. I know some people say like if, it, if it's more than a certain amount of money, then I'm going to collect funds after the fact. Uh, I don't know exactly how they do that. But um, yeah, that was one, one thing to keep in mind. I also talked to another guy who did a Kickstarter, and he had like a deck of playing cards. And he accidentally made a reward, because you can't change the rewards once someone backs one of the rewards, and he said it was like $10 to ship anywhere in the world, and he just lost all sorts of money because he, I mean, you could refund people their money, but um, he wanted to get his books, or his cards out. So the next step before you go live is to get feedback. It's really easy in Kickstarter. Um, you can create this free preview link, and you can send it around to all your family and friends. I wasn't really sure about this one because I didn't want, you only have one opportunity to get in front of some people, like your parents, they'll, you know, they'll come back and look at your stuff as many times as possible. But some people, you send them that link, and then they might not come back when it is live. They might forget about it. So I kind of was choosy about who I shared my preview link with. And then go live, the fun part. It's like, okay, it's easy now. It's all over. No, that's not the case. It's so much more work after you hit the go live button than even preparing for all of the Kickstarters. You have to be really responsive as a creator. Um, like. You just want to like make sure that everyone who backs you feels engaged and part of your project because that's really what Kickstarter is. It's a community. It's other people that want to see you be successful, and it's important to you know, share what you're going through with everybody. 
So I had these awesome backers that had their nerdy responses, you know, <laughs> pledge $42 or 3.14. I thought that was really cute. So I, I, I thought it was good to acknowledge these people as being creative. And part of that goes into project updates. So along the way, you want to tell people what you're experiencing, what you're going through, what it, what it takes to make a book. You know, all those processes I, I shared with people so they could learn with me and you know, experience it with me. Social media is a big one. Um, in Kickstarter, there's an option after you back a project to uh, tweet about it or send it with your friends. But it doesn't have, like if I work for Kickstarter, I'd change it so that the creators could say what their handle was, and then when you um, went to back someone's project, it would also include their handle. Because right now, you, you don't know if someone's backing your project unless you're following the whole word. You have to go manually search for it. And, and then you can thank people for backing your projects and make it personal. Uh, this is something I didn't really do that well, I think. Um, but getting press, like you kind of have to, the fun part about all this for me was you l learn a little bit about business and what it takes to do marketing and promoting your product. And um, from, I should have started from the beginning going out and saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Here's my Kickstarter. I'm going to launch it. Um, you want to you know, write an article about me. So after my book was live, that's when I went out and, and reached out to like my, I went to Harry Mellon, so I asked them and they put a little article in the tartan about it. Um, there were some people that just like to write about Kickstarter, so you can go to them and say, hey, you want to do a little piece on what I'm doing. So that's something I would encourage people to do from the beginning or even before you do your Kickstarter, just because the more press you have, the more eyes come to your story. Uh, this is the fun one a lot of people do is stretch goals. So um, you want people to come back to your project, even the backers that you already have. Um, I made it so that after a certain amount of backers, the size of the book got bigger. So it just kind of encouraged everyone to keep sharing the words, saying, hey, back this project, we've got to get another you know, $25 <laughs> to get the next size book. Um, so yeah, lot, lot, stretch goals is fun, keeps people engaged. Cross promotion, so Kickstarter, like I said, is a big community, and all the other creators are really usually very nice, and they're just like all of us. So you can reach out to them and say, you know, if you have a, like I reached out to a lot of people who have books and I said, do you want to do some cross promotion? So when they did an update, they might say at the very end, you know, you might consider the, a robot story too, because it's similar to my book. Uh, that helps, again, reach more, more eyes. So once you're live, there's this really cool thing called the Kickstarter dashboard, and it shows you all these stats about your project. So. Here we go, so you can see within the first three days or so I reached my funding goal. I set it pretty low. I knew I wanted to do this um, regardless of how much money I raised, so I, I, I set it, frankly, way too low. Um, and I reached it almost right away. Uh, it seemed like everyone was very supportive at the beginning, and then it kind of was steady throughout the middle. There's a part in Kickstarter, like the middle couple weeks, it's usually pretty slow, and then towards the end it kicks up again. The referrer section is pretty neat. Um, Mikey mentioned that Kickstarter takes 10% of your money. And at first I was like, ah, oh, they're just a middleman. They're not doing anything. Like, why should I give them 10%? But then seeing the breakdown of where the money came from made it make sense in my mind. It was justified because, you know, 52% of the people that backed my project came from Kickstarter. Just, you know, browsing around the website, that's how they found my thing. So it's almost like a free marketing spot for you. And then you can see the breakdown of like how people found you. There's different areas within Kickstarter. There's the staff picks, the you know children's book area, advanced discovery. There's all these different spots within Kickstarter that you can see how people found your, your stuff. Some people came directly to my website at robotstory.com, Facebook, and so on. And then the video stats. Um, I did the video myself, but it looks like about 50% of people were, like watched the whole thing, so that was cool. <laughs> uh, you can see how many views, how many people viewed it outside of Kickstarter. Um, the reward popularity, you can kind of see this light there. But Kickstarter says the most common amount of money that people like to spend is $25. Uh, for me, I wanted my book to be reasonable, so it was $15, and that was obviously my most popular award. So the, another cool tool is called KickTrack, and you can look up any Kickstarter project um, on KickTrack, but you can see a breakdown for pledges per day and how much money you made per day. Um, you can see the spikes, you know, it's like, I don't know what happened this day, but 82 people backed me, yay. 
So it's pretty fun if you're running a Kickstarter because like your phone's constantly buzzing and you're always looking like, who backed me and how much did they spend? <laughs> so that was really fun. I think my husband got annoyed with me at dinner. I'm like, you know, checking to see who's backing me. So the last 48 hours, how many of you have shopped on Kickstarter? Shopped? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a little star where you can say, remind me about a project. And then people will get an email the last 48 hours of a project and you can go and uh, back people then. So that's when you're going to see also a lot of, um, you have to be prepared for the last 45, 48 hours because a lot of people are going to come back to your site and you want to convince those people that weren't sure before if they wanted to back you. And then as Mikey said, I updated since his thing. You really do have to write your tombstone. So I didn't know about this. So now forever, my project has final hours. And if you search for it on Kickstarter, it's like, is this still live? What's going on here? Because they won't let you edit it after the final hours. So yeah, you can edit your, edit your Kickstarter show, like where people can buy the product after. Um, maybe send them to your website or PayPal or whatever you want to do after the fact. And then I raised money. Yay, I beat my goal. I got $13,000. Woo. It's not over yet. <laughs> At some point you realize that you are going to be doing whatever you're doing. So you know, <laughs> you have to fulfill these orders. So I had to buy an ISBN number because this is like a real book. I'm publishing it myself. And um, I wasn't sure whether I should buy one or I should buy more. And the optimist in me is like, I'm going to make more books later. So I bought 10 ISBN numbers. It was like $250, not a big deal. But that was the one thing you have to do. You can scan it even if you want. The next thing to do early is backer surveys. I still have people who have not filled out their backer surveys, which is really annoying, especially if you're doing t-shirts, because you need sizes. You don't want to like order a million of extras. So send out your backer survey early. Um, the problem with the backer survey is you can't, you can't send it twice. So you have to know exactly what kind of information you want to ask people before you send it out. And then it's like, OK, I'm, I'm going to do a book. How do I print it? Um, I looked at some companies within the US, and it was just, it wasn't going to happen. It was like $8 a book. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have to experience buying something overseas and how to work with people overseas. Also a really cool learning experience. Uh, so I, I used Alibaba. Um, I entered all the information about what I wanted to make and in the book, what it was going to look like. And I got a bunch of like quotes right away from people, like how much it was going to cost to do all these books. and. Um, you can even do prototypes. I actually didn't do a prototype. I don't know why I didn't for this first time. Um, but you can spend a little bit extra, like $100, and they'll print your book and mail it to you. And you can see what it looks like before you actually go through the project. So importing. Um, now you like place the order. You're not sure what's going to happen. Like You're working with this company overseas. And the, the English barrier is a little weird. You feel like you're getting scammed. It's like, are, am I actually going to get books? <laughs> And then there's all these hidden costs. So you don't really, like, when you're creating your funding goal, you, I don't know. It was a little frustrating. But uh, here's all the hidden costs that I had to deal with. So maybe this will help you guys if you ever have to import something. So I'll, there's this customs entry service, $125. And there's overnight courier, $20. And then import security filing, $25. OK. Some bond thing, $150. There's a duties tax for $2. All right, I'll pay $2. Ocean Spray, okay. I already paid shipping as part of this. I paid shipping to the publisher. So it's like, okay, a little extra, I don't know. Maybe this is part of the, the boat fees. And then if your stuff is being um, examined by, um, what's the name of it? Well, anyway, the local people that examine to make sure you're not importing drugs or something. If, if they have to keep it in a warehouse overnight, then you have to pay for every night that it's waiting. So $195 because it took three days to go through my book. And then I had to get it delivered to my house. So luckily I live in Baltimore and there's ports nearby, but I had to get it from the port to my actual house. So it ended up costing about $1,000 that I knew was going to be, I was expecting maybe $500, but $1,000 ended up adding another dollar per, per book. So just keep, keep that in mind that there's some hidden costs. And then uh, order fulfillment. Um, my husband's funny. He's, this was his Instagram. He said, one to me, got a mail room. But I was really excited when I got all my books, and so I kind of destroyed our house. <laughs> Started doing all this order for film at myself. It was like, piles of stuff everywhere. He <laughs> doesn't have a lot of followers. <laughs> Kickstarter, I'm like, I'll do a fall on one. 
and I'll make a whole brand of my thing, and I'll do some stuffed animals. And it, like I, I took the characters, I sent it to another company I found in China that did plush animals. And how cool is that? Like I made stuffed animals. Like who can say they did a stuffed animal? <laughs> um, but you gotta think about your audience. It seemed like nobody wanted them on Kickstarter. I don't know why. They're so cool. I want to take all the lessons learned from my first Kickstarter and play around with it and see how it would work the second time, second go around. So I did a number of things differently. This time I wanted to play with um, the idea of having a limited number of, of things first to see if people would like right away pledge a lot because they want to get it for $2 cheaper. And that really wasn't that popular. And then um, you know I wanted to, to also include the book, so I packaged the book as one of them. But I wanted to keep my rewards really simple. And another thing I did this time around was I made a professional video. So I, it, it was actually pretty cheap, it was like $1,500. I made this really cool video, and you guys can check it out on Kickstarter. Like the camera, I followed my kids around playing with these stuffed animals, and it turned out really cool. But I was also a little more serious, whereas my first one I was like more fun and peppy. And I don't know if like that was boring being more serious, so I don't know. So really what I learned from the, my second Kickstarter was Kickstarter is also a marketing tool. <laughs> so I got all of these book orders, out of nowhere, because people just wanted the book, they didn't really want the plush animal. So I had all my extra books from the first one, and people would come to, I, I'm selling them on my, my website at robotstory.com, on Amazon, and Think Geek, and people would go and buy my book after watching the video about the plush animals. So, yeah, I've always wanted to have something on Think Geek, so that was really cool. I, yeah, I sent out an email, I'm like, hey, I made a nerdy book, do you want to put it in your catalog? So that experience of knowing like how to approach a, a company and get them to put your, your item in their catalog, that was also an awesome learning experience. But I was unsuccessful with my second Kickstarter. Sad. Didn't even come close. I, I looked on KickTrack and I was like, you're projected to, you know, even out at $800 or whatever it was. So I ended up canceling it before the funding period ended. But I want to share another story with you. How many of you guys are familiar with The Coolest Cooler? Okay, most of you. So this is the, the latest top um, grossing product on Kickstarter. And the first time this guy launched, he set his pledge, his uh, goal for 125,000 and he fell short. So, you know, I fell short with my flesh animals too. It's okay, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> but so he, he made a bunch of changes to his project and he relaunched it. This time he did a number of things differently and he reached 13, over $13 million. Like, that's ridiculous. He didn't even reach it the first time. No one even got to that, and now he's got $13 million. Just amazing story. So, I, there's a lot of websites that do a comparison of what he did differently the second time. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought this was pretty interesting. So the second time he increased his, his funding period. So the first time he only did 30 days, the second time around he went up to 52 days. He also launched during July, so the first time he did it in November when people aren't really drinking cold beverages. He did it in July when people are like, oh, I'd love like a cold beverage right now. Um, so that, that was probably smart on his, his thing. He also knew that he had all, came close to his funding goal. He got 100000 and if you don't reach it, you don't get it, like I said. So he lowered it down to fifty. so he probably didn't need all that money in order to actually go through um, fulfilling the product. So he lowered it in hopes to at least get 50000 um, not realizing he'd be a millionaire. And I thought it was pretty neat seeing the stats of like what, you know, what part of the United States backed him, how his video ranked. So there's hope for my plush animals still. <laughs> but um, I wanted to also share with you guys some of the cool Kickstarter products that I'm currently backing. I think it's, like Kickstarter is a community and it's a lot of like pay it forward and, sh and I I'm kind of obsessed, I probably back I don't know, 50 plus projects now. But um, yeah, and, and if you have any questions, like if you're gonna do something around wearables, there's a little button to like reach out to people, reach out to them. You can send them a message and be like, hey, I wanna do this too, how do I get started? And they'll like share where they manufacture, like all this information, everyone's just so nice. So this one I'm really excited about, it's like a wearable. Um, and you, have, you can like light up your different glasses based on the app. So I like that one. Uh, this is like a party game. It's only $10. It's a card game. Um, it looked fun. 
This one's kind of cool. It's, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this one, but there's that little camera on your laptops and the world's spying on you, you know? And so this, this idea, it's only $5. It's this little magnet that you put over the camera so people can't watch you. <laughs> I also want to show you guys a little wearable thing I made here. So I, I backed another Kickstarter called MetaWare. It was in April. It's no longer running. But you can go to mbient.com and, and buy it. It's this little board um, It's for making wearables. So it's got Bluetooth low energy. It's got an accelerometer. It's got temperature sensors. You can also add other sensors. But um, let's see if you guys can see it. So I made a little, I made a little app to, um, to listen for tweets. So I'm nerdy, and I, I'm playing with Cordova. So I'm, like, I'm going to make a Cordova plugin. So I can interact with this metaware and send it information, like light information. And, um, and so I did that, and then I was like, right, I'll use the Twitter streaming API. So I listen for tweets, and if there's a tweet around Monktoberfest or Lisa Sika, then it lights up a different color. Um, <laughs> pretty cool. You can change the color, too. So my next round, I'll probably make it so when people tweet like the hex number, they'll change the color based on what people are tweeting. <laughs> Yeah, so my husband still gives me a hard time about this. <laughs> I'm like, I, I want to do it anyway. I knew I wanted to do it. I'm like, I have some money to play with on the side, you know? It's, this isn't like what I'm doing full time. So I'm like, I'll just put it pretty low. And my husband's like, you're never going to reach $2,500. So I'm like, oh, should I lower it? I'm like, well, it's going to cost this amount for my illustrator. I kind of calculated how much it would cost. I calculated, um, the sh what I thought the shipping cost would be, and what I thought maybe the importing cost would be, and then um, yeah, I, I figured I'd, I'd do a thousand books. So a lot of them have a minimum order quantity, and this particular one had at least a thousand thousand books. So I knew I was going to at least get that much, and knowing how much per book that was, how much it was going to cost, that's kind of how I I started to think about what I was going to do my funding goal. And this is about did you aim, did you break even, or you bought or you yeah, so I ended up raising thirteen thousand, and I made like I made about two thousand, and then I had about four hundred extra books, um, and then most of those I sold to ThinkGeek. I do have a few left. There's a couple I was giving around here, um, but ThinkGeek barely gives you any money, and that's fine. I'm all about just sharing the story, not really about making money on it. Um, but then I I paid for the the fancy video for my second Kickstarter, so it really comes out about even. But it's all in my play. Like I, I like to put money aside for play, um, and that's just coming out of a different pile of money than like the rest of the funds. It's not coming from the kids' college fund. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So there's there's a bunch of crowdfunding platforms you can use. Why why Kickstarter as opposed to any others? So I I looked into Indiegogo, and that one's kind of cool because you can you can get the money regardless of reaching your funding goal. So that was one thing I considered. I'm like, well. Oh, should I, should I do that? It seemed like Kickstarter was more popular. It was reaching more of an audience that I was going after because my book, it, even though it's a kid's book, it's also got a nerdy flair to it. And I think a lot of Kickstarter projects are the wearables, the IoT, like the, the nerds like us who want to back other nerds. So I thought that that audience was the one that I was going to reach the best at. Yeah. Did you think about running like maybe test some part on Kickstarter party and getting you go? I should I should have done them both at the same time to see which one was more successful. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I'm just curious. So you said you, you got a quote from a U.S. printer. It was like eight dollars a quote. Yep. How much cheaper was it after you put all the prices together and shipping and import duties and all that to, to have everything printed in China and shipped over? Yeah. So this book cost me two dollars a book. So two dollars a book plus I figure another dollar for import fees. Uh, so two dollars a book for shipping. What's that? It's a third of the price. Yep. So it's like $3 a book. 